Hello and a very warm welcome. It's wonderful that so many of you have been able to join us for this, the second in this season of Somerville at Home Digital Broadcasts. I'm Rebecca Jones. I'm the BBC's arts correspondent. Uh, I'm also a presenter on the BBC News Channel. But of course, most importantly, I am also a Somervillian. It's a great pleasure for me to be part of this conversation between drum roll Jan Royal, the principal of Somerville, and the journalist, author, and activist Joan Bakewell. Welcome to you both. Tonight's talk is called A Life Less Ordinary because, let's face it, we are joined this evening by two trailblazing women, both baronesses, although. I hope for the purpose of this evening's talk that Joan and Jan will suffice. Um, this is a fantastic opportunity for us to hear from them. And I propose that we will have a conversation of say about 20 minutes or so. But this is also a chance for you to ask Joan and Jan questions. And the platform that we're using tonight gives you two ways of interacting with them. So the first is, if you look at the screen, say something nice text box, which is at the bottom right of your screen. And do feel free to say anything presumably nice there um, to us or indeed to each other. Now, the second and in some ways the most important one for me is the ask a question button. Now, that's also at the bottom of your screen, but a little to the left. Now, this enables you to not only ask questions, but also to review and vote on each other's questions. Uh, so please do make use of that. And um, please do ask Joan and Jan all those questions that you've always really wanted to ask them. I urge you, please, don't be shy. Um, a quick word of introduction. Uh, Joan, Jan, sorry, you're going to have to sit there and, and blush and, and cover your ears. Um, Joan Bakewell, what can I say, really? Uh, a heroine of mine, journalist, novelist, television presenter, Labour Party peer, and in many ways, for me, the most important thing, former BBC Arts correspondent. Um, <laughs> After studying history at Newnham College, Cambridge, she joined the BBC and made her name presenting the discussion programme Late Night Lineup. She presented the ethics series Heart of the Matter, and she is still presenting programmes on Sky Arts, uh, Portrait of the Year, Landscape Artist of the Year. Uh, she became a Dane, then a peer, was the government's former advisor on older people, and was also named Humanist of the Year in 2017. Uh, where do we begin with Jan? Well, Jan's career began with six years as General Secretary of the British Labour Group in the European Parliament. She subsequently became a senior advisor, then leader of the Welsh Office of the European Commission, and that was before becoming a peer. In 2008, she was appointed leader of the opposition in the House of Lords and subsequently joined the Privy Council. She stepped down in 2015, but not to put her feet up, but to chair charities and champion the many, many causes close to her heart, including women's rights. And she became principal of Somerville in 2017. Quite hard condensing our two very distinguished guests into uh, two short paragraphs. I think the most important thing now is that we uh, get uh, cracking and I want to start by asking you both, if you don't mind, how you first met. How did you become friends? Joan. <laughs> well, I, I, Jan was already the leader of the opposition in the House of Lords when I was admitted, though she was my leader. Uh, and I was very pleased that that was so. I got to know her very well. She was brilliant at the job. And of course, we're both on the Labour benches. So we both uh, follow the, you know, the course of Labour politics. And I dare say we have a lot of in common. We, we do indeed. And Joan, uh, oh, well, she does know it now, but she's been one of my or my role model for a long, long time. But sitting next to her on those red benches made me think even more, this is the woman to be like. <laughs> I could not agree more. So let's, let's rewind to university. Uh, and I know that you were I think the first members of your family to go to university but Joan am I right that you didn't actually get into Oxford? Yes. No I didn't I failed to get into Oxford I had a very strange 
Uh, I was at a grammar school where no one had been to Oxbridge before. And they said so they crammed, the teachers were very kind and crammed me with all that they knew. But as with my generation, a lot of the teachers were rather old. Um, they had, their boyfriends, if they'd had them, lovers or sweethearts, had gone to the First World War and there was a great shortage of men after the First World War. And a great many of the teachers of that time went, uh, uh, the women of that time be became teachers. And that was true of my teachers. Now, what happened, of course, was that they had rather old fashioned ideas of teaching and simply recited their own lessons that they'd had at university years earlier to me. <laughs> and they crammed me hard. So I, I passed sort of entrance exams. And I think Oxford wanted to take a look at me because I was only 17 and they thought that was rather unusual. So they had me up and, and, and gave me a, a looking over and I clearly didn't pass muster because I was completely overwhelmed by the nature of the scholarship they represented, the breadth of the place. I was coming from Stockport, which was full of smoking chimneys. And so I was overwhelmed by that. And of course, they didn't want to admit me. They wrote me a nice letter saying it was good to meet you but you need to wait. Uh, um, and I waited another year. And then I applied to Cambridge and then I got an interview and then I passed. It was an, an exam and an interview specifically to the college. That's how I came well, to go. Yeah. Joan, Oxford's loss was Cambridge's gain. I, I think uh, we can all agree on that. Uh, Jan, tell us a little bit about your early university years because you were at university in London, weren't you? I was, uh, but before I got to university, I said to my head teacher one day, sir, what's this Oxbridge place? Not understanding that it was two different places. And he said to me, don't trouble your, you know, don't trouble, darling, You're, you, you won't get there anyway. So I didn't even think of going for Oxford. And my goodness, if only I'd come to Somerville. Oh, not, uh, Newnham's okay, but uh, it, it really <laughs> changes lives phenomenally, this place. I went to London, Westfield. I, I wasn't terribly happy there. Um, I made a couple of good friends. I quite liked my studies. But I can see the difference between an Oxbridge mm -hmm. education and education at other universities. There are wonderful universities up and down the country, but there's nothing quite like some of them. Can I say, uh, Rebecca, what is interesting in both our stories is that we were encouraged by our teachers to have low expectations. Mm. We were actually told to have low expectations. Mm. And that was something of a hurdle jam, wasn't it? it was. Just like, oh no, I'm not, oh, I'm not gonna make it. You know, I'm not gonna make it. So, Do you think that's something that's changed, Jan? Oh, absolutely. I think it's absolutely wonderful the way young people say, oh, I'm going, I'm going here, I'm going to the Gare, I'm going to travel the world, I'm going to go to America, I'd perhaps go to university on the continent. I, I think their ambitions are true. You can't have big enough ambitions, and it's wonderful. Jan, do you see that? It's true in most circumstances, but there are still pockets in the United Kingdom where the aspirations of young people are not as they should be. I come from the Forest of Dean, and I would say that the aspirations of most young people in the Forest of Dean, they're not reaching for the stars as they should be. Mm. Is that because it's a rural community, Jan? Yes, but also there are some schools in which aspirations, kids are not given the aspirations or the confidence to achieve those aspirations. OK, well, look, let's move on from university to the start of your career. And I'll start perhaps with you, Jan. Am I right? Your first job was importing flowers into Europe from South America. It was because I did a degree in Spanish and French. And then I did a secretarial course, as one did in those days. Um, and I wanted to commercialise my Spanish. So I started working for this company. But I only did it for six, about six months because I got the politics bug, but specifically the European politics bug. And it was, you know, we hadn't been in the European Union very long, but sort of six years. And I just wanted to be part of that wonderful project, which I've always believed in and I still do. And it was easy to move into that world, was it then? Uh, I heard, well, I, I'd been to Strasbourg and Brussels and I'd met people in the socialist group and said, if a job comes up in London, please will you let me know? And they did. And I applied for it, along with, I'm sure, lots of other people. But I was the fortunate one who was given the job. And Joan, did you go straight to the BBC from Cambridge? 
Yes, I did. I got a job as a studio manager, which, as you know, will be a technical job. And yes. as I said earlier, I'd never met anyone who studied chemistry. I didn't know anything about electricity. So I was extremely bad at this job. It was <laughs> completely the wrong area for me to go, but I was inside. And what's interesting is that I only ever had a job on the staff of the BBC for those two years. After that, I've always been freelance. And oh, nice. after two years, I was so discouraged by my failure. I mean, there's nothing like being bad at something to make to put you off. So I just thought I must get away from this. It's the wrong path, it's totally wrong. And I went off to do it, try out lots of different um, other jobs. And I went to back to the careers officer at Cambridge and said, I don't know where I'm going. I'm really at a loss here. And I tried, I tried teaching, I was hopeless. I tried copywriting in an advertising agency. And I was rather good at it because you just had to be rather slick with words. And I found that came easily. But I, I found that I didn't feel at one with its purpose. I mean, I, I was very high-minded in those days. I think I felt that advertising was getting people to spend money they didn't have on things they didn't need. And that, that wasn't really a very good social pattern. It wasn't one that I wanted to be part of. So I enjoyed the company. It was all very bright and breezy, but I left that. And... And then I married, and I, I married we, young. We married in those days quite early. I was 20, married when I was 22. I had my first child at 24. And then I hit the problem that was dawning on women in the 50s and 60s that just, just staying at home and looking after a baby wasn't intellectually fulfilling. And I remember my days as a studio manager when women used to arrive with a script which they had written they would go into the studio and record a talk and then they would go home and they would get a key, uh, they get a fee of three guineas for the talk. And I thought, that's, that's what I can do now. And it's yes. called being a freelance. And I've been a freelance ever since. <laughs> How much, um, Jan, I mean, I, I don't want to sort of suddenly inject a very serious tone, but I'm, I'm interested uh, particularly in how times have changed. How much harassment was there, misogyny? How much was that part of the, the landscape? I suppose I'm asking both of you what sort of obstacles you've, you've felt you've, you've faced in your careers. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't that there was misogyny out there. It was that that was the culture we lived in. So it was, you know, we were the fish and we swam in that ocean and the ocean was misogynistic. The world was run by men. There were some bright women who made it, but they were um, very determined and very talented, of course. There were quite a number in the BBC, actually. But nonetheless, the, the men set the rules and they set the behavior. So they behaved as they wanted to behave. And we were, in a sense, not consulted and... Of course, it's the major change that I've lived through. The biggest change of all is this change in the status and the attitude of women to themselves and the, the world to women. Jan, is that, what are your thoughts on that? Is that your view as well? Yes. Even when I had quite senior positions in the European Commission in Brussels, it was always assumed that because, I mean, I might have been in a room full of men at that time, 1995, I was always the person who was assumed would make the tea, etc. I know that's a small thing, but it's true. Mm -hmm. um, and it was rather like that until the beginning of the 2000s, in fact, certainly sur le continent, uh, and I'm sure it's the same here as well. Um, mm -hmm. But I think you're absolutely right, Joan, that, that women now have got more confidence in themselves, and that's part of it. I mean, you know, we really do now, thanks to... Uh, you know, other women who have gone before us, women on whose shoulders we stand, we've got more confidence in ourselves to stand up for what we believe in and not to be subjected to the things which people used to be subjected to. I, I think that's made a tremendous difference. I mean, the whole culture has changed. I mean, no one in, uh, in politics would, you know, would insult a woman, a woman because of her being a woman. I mean, we're, we're as much uh, um, objects of abuse as other politicians, male politicians too, but there's no discrimination. People treat yeah. us all the same. Well, that's a positive change, but you know, no one needs me to tell them that we're living what feels like very challenging times, not just COVID, but you know, gosh, where to start, climate change, recession, racism. Uh, I, I could go on. To me, it feels as if the world, well, 
I suppose my question is, Joan, first of all, with your long perspective, is the world worse or have there always been these problems? Well, we know more about it, of course. I mean, and I'm in my 80s. So I do remember the post-war consensus which went on, which began with the Attlee government, and the, which brought in the health service and the whole health welfare state was virtually invented at that time. And there was a huge enthusiasm for it. And because it was an after the war generation, we did feel such relief that the war had ended. We thought peace had arrived forever and that everything would go on getting better. And that was a wonderful um, mood in which to be a young person. The world is getting better, plenty of jobs. You could rent easily. You could even afford a home once you've done a little bit of saving. So the world seemed enormously blessed at the time because we didn't know about, I don't know, the Kikuyu in Kenya and um, troubles in Cyprus, the whole problems of um, post-colonialism. We didn't know our horizons were quite limited or perhaps we just weren't, didn't care so much. But I think that has changed. We all know now about the state of the world, the state of the planet, the state of uh, pollution, the damage we're doing, the ecosystem. There's terrible stories that David Attenborough tells us about, you know, the dying of different species. I don't think we knew because there wasn't as much information around. Jan, what keeps you awake at night? I think the world's a very unsafe place. And uh, I really fear what's happening in terms of the sort of the hard men who are ru ru ruling our world. And I fear what's happening to democracies, to our multilateral institutions. And I think that we've forgotten how to disagree agreeably um, throughout the world. And it was that wonderful, wonderful woman, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who we are you know, mourning for so many reasons. She actually said that what we've got to do is, is learn to agree disagree agreeably and um, we've got to do that but I guess it's climate change which is my major concern and for everything that brings with this I think it's the intergovernmental panel on um, climate change which says we've got 10 years 10 short years in order to you know try to reverse all the dangers that, that we've done to the world and of course as a consequence of climate change we're seeing more and more refugees in the world and oh God, we've just got to do something about it. What gives me hope is the young people of this country and the young people of this world. They really deeply care. They've got passion. They've got energy. And I think that they will lead us to the right place in terms of climate change. But we've got to do something about that. Well, we don't know how, Jan, do we? I mean, I applaud what they do and I approve of all their radicalism and their protesting and so on but we don't know where the, in what direction the, the solution lies. I mean, I don't eat much meat anymore. It's not a, much of a, co a contribution, but I notice little things like that. Uh, we should all be driving uh, electric cars and then we should give up cars. I mean, we've got a long way to go and I don't have a sense of direction very much. We do, scientists are giving us some direction and what really offends me, I mean, we can see what's happening on the west coast of America. I mean, there's fires everywhere. My son lives in San Diego and it's just sort of rosy clouds and smoke all the time. And yet you get the president of the United States going there and saying, well, you know, it's gonna rain soon and it's not really to do with climate change. And you think, oh my God, um, you know, we can, if we work together in this world, we, we can do something about this. And I do think that, you know, science can lead us in the right direction. We can all make small changes to our lives. They do make a difference. But ultimately, I think we've got to change the way in which we live in this world. Yes, I think there's a, we need leadership. The world needs leadership. Good, good leadership. And there is there's no one. No. The, well, one great leader, I think, in Europe at the moment is Angela Merkel, and she's going to be retiring soon, and she will leave such a gap. Well, I know we've probably everyone joining tonight laughter, um, but since we've hit on a serious subject, I know, Jan, you specifically want to talk about dying tonight, and I wondered why was that? Because Joan's here, and because I thought that her programmes, we've got to talk about death or dying, whatever it was called, they were so important, Joan, because I think that in order to appreciate life, 
we have to think about dying and we are unable as a society to talk about death and dying and i think that in this covid world where we're all confronted by death we're all af or afraid of what's going to happen to us it's more and more important and i want to make talking about death part of our lives we don't do that and i think that your programs on the bbc enabled many families to start talking about these things around the kitchen table it was very interesting i did it for about um Seven years, I did six programmes a year called We Need to Talk About Death. Yeah. And just before COVID hit, the BBC cancelled the series. <laughs> and it's rather <laughs> unhappy decision at that point. But I found it enormously interesting and, and also very liberating for me because I'm in my 80s and my generation are dying off. I mean, every day I, I get a message or I notice in the paper that someone part of my generation is no longer there, they've gone. And I, you know, oh, I didn't get a chance to say goodbye or who should I write a letter to? But almost every, daily now. So I, I'm very close to death. I mean, I also, I'm in my late 80s. I can't be far from it myself. So I am very aware of it. And um, I'm not sure what I f feel about it. First of all, I know it's there very positively. And I know there are ways of talking about it. And there are many people who are, comfortable now talking about it but i do think that people need to talk to their own families about it they need to talk about their aging relations they need to talk about the old people that they know because old people aren't going to come up with spontaneous comments because younger people don't believe in death you know, they don't think it's going to happen to them and they don't think it's going to happen to their loved ones they somehow believe that families are eternal and we need to say or to help the younger people say, when you die, do you want us to be there? Do you want to be in hospital? Do you want to be resuscitated? Do you want to be buried at sea? Do you want to be cremated? You know, once you've broken the taboo, we can talk about it. I mean, I, I made a point of saying, um, at my funeral, I want Jerusalem. I want everybody on their feet singing <laughs> Jerusalem. So, and I know they'll do that now because it's a tiny thing that you can mention. I, I think I remember having a conversation with the novelist Julian Barnes, who did say, I'd be interested to know what you think about this, Joan, that there is a distinction between dying and death, and that actually people feel relatively comfortable with the idea of death, in, the, in other words, because we know it's all going to happen to us. But the way in which we die is what really um, frightens people. I think you're quite right. I, I think people say, well, I don't mind de being dead because I won't know. It's the, how we get there. And that's that whole um, episode of declining years and declining health. And um, the average um, length over which people begin to de seriously decline in health is about two years before they actually die. I mean, I'm talking about beginning to ail. Um, the actual final illness may well be very short indeed, or indeed you could right walk under a bus but um i think people are fearful of pain they're mm. fearful of um suffering and i think they're fearful of how they will feel as the doctor says with a very serious face can we have a a, a talk in the in the private room here it happens in hospitals could we just go into the private room and talk to the family and you think that's it mm. how will i respond this may be an area we don't want to go to this evening, but both Joan and I are strong proponents of dignity in dying. And we vote in every vote that we can do in the House of Lords, do we not, Joan? And we are we do. We, It can't keep coming back as a subject. Well, and there's been a lot of research done, and it seems that the majority of people are in favour of it, but it runs up against certain lobbies who feel uh, that it's their job to protect us from ourselves and not allow us to have a deciding voice in our own deaths. And I regret that. I think that's an infringement of our freedom. Too. Well, Jan, you, you very cleverly, I think, have helped me move on um, to the House of Lords, um, talking about the way in which you both vote. You're both members, equally outspoken, I might suggest. Jan, for you, has that ever led to, to difficulties? Have you ever felt, oh, I've got to curb my tongue? Or, or do you feel free to say exactly what you think there? 
I feel free to say exactly what I think. Sometimes you have to couch it in, in a way in which is not offensive. But I, I, it's a place where you can really, it's a great platform for expressing your ideas and for being an advocate. And I think that is absolutely wonderful. And the one thing I really like about the House of Lords is the fact that people on all benches have friendships across the political divides. And it, it leads to terrific conversations. But sometimes when you are wanting to press for an amendment or change the law in some way, you work together to achieve that consensus and to you know, defeat the government, to add to a bill or whatever. Last night, I'm sure we both voted on an amendment to the agricultural bill, which is all to do with enshrining in legislation, in the agricultural legislation, labour rights, environmental um, standards, et cetera, et cetera. And that was a cross-party uh, consensus that was put together. And it's great. And we won. And we're going to make a real difference there, are we not, Joan, to that particular? Definitely. And we all voted from home because we don't, <laughs> we don't go into the chamber. And the other thing about the House of Lords, um, and there's much wrong with it, it's far too big for one thing, but there is a lot of experience in the House of Lords. You go there when you've had a life full of experience already. So there are many judges, retired ambassadors, retired heads of the civil service, um, and people know what they're talking about. So it's always interesting to, to be in a debate where informed people are telling you what, how it seems from their point of view. And we all have our favorites, but um, but when there's a particularly good speaker with real authority, you notice that the chamber fills up because people want to hear what they have to say. Yeah, we're at risk of tiring the moon with our talking. So I do want to just look to the future before we move on to questions. Jan, what else do you want to achieve? What are your main priorities at the moment? I want to build resilience in Somerville. I want to build resilience in the young people that we've got here. I want to make Somerville and I want to make our world more sustainable. I want there to be greater equality of opportunity for the students in getting here and when they get here. Um, and I want this to be a place of excellence. But then, out, so that's what I want for Somerville. That's what I want to do here outside of Somerville. I want to work on global democracy and I want to work on the place of women in the world. I'll never, I'll never give up on that. And I ought to give you an opportunity just to tell us briefly about your hardship fund. Yes, indeed. So throughout, for many, many years, uh, students have suffered hardship. When Joan and I were students, that was not the case. We went to university, it was free, we got grants, but now that's not the case. But with COVID, it's made us realise that there, some of our students are suffering serious, serious hardship. There are some of our students who, during the lockdown, were studying and doing final exams at the kitchen table whilst looking after siblings. The playing field is not level. Some of these students need enhanced um, IT equipment because everybody needs access to good IT equipment. Some of our uh, graduate students have had to extend the period in which they're studying because they've not been able to go off and do their field work, et cetera, et cetera. So there is real hardship. So we are launching next week a hardship fund. We are aiming to raise within one month £100,000 so that we can help these students and all the money that we raise will go to these students. And it's just so important that our students are going to get through this very difficult, challenging time and that all students should have an opportunity to do that. Joan, I've no doubt you support that, but what else What else would you like to achieve? Well, I find that the, um, the, the whole COVID and the lockdown that we all went through has brought families closer together. And I think that's in, to be tremendously welcome because that keeps the generations in touch with each other. And there was a danger of the young blaming the old and the old feeling guilty about the young. Now, I'm, so what I want to sustain and improve is the treatment of older people uh, as, as we advance as a society. I mean, Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party, said in his speech yesterday, he wanted Britain to be a place that was good to grow old in. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be a, that's a wonderful definition of what we should have. We should look at old age 
without fear, without anxiety about where we live, how we'll eat, who we'll meet, uh, and who will care for us. And I think that's an enormous target now that we've got to fulfill. So we want it to be a good place to be young and a good place to be old. Yeah. And middle-aged. Um, middle <laughs> <laughs> let's have a look at some of the questions that we've had. So um, this is from Rachel Evans. Thank you, Rachel. To Jan, what is life like at Somerville for students at staff and staff at the moment in view of the restrictions? And how is Somerville ensuring they are supported in these strange times? Thank you for your question, Rachel. At the moment, um, we've got some students here doing VAC res because they're revising for exams. We've got about a huge, uh, about 100 students who are in quarantine because they are international students and they've got to spend their 14 days in quarantine. So it's all a little odd. But of course, it's going to be a term, a Michaelmas term, very unlike any other because we've got social distancing of two meters. When you're inside, if you're not living in your house, if you're not in your household bubble, you're going to have to wear face coverings, but we are doing absolutely everything we can, both to keep our staff and our students safe, and to give the students a good as, as good an experience as possible. They will still be getting their tutorials uh, in person, um, and we want them to be able to socialize as much as possible, and we're trying to organize as many social opportunities within college so that it, don't have to go out and so they're not tempted when they're outside college not to social distance and to mix in ways in which they shouldn't. So we do want to give them a great experience but it's not going to be easy. Joan I'm going to put this question to you and I'm very grateful to Sally Patmore for putting it because it was one of my questions but I've run out of time to ask it. Um, Sally's asking and several other people are interested what achievements are you most proud of? Oh, um, well, I was I was the presenter and the journalist on a series called Heart of the Matter. And we used to take different issues of the day, which were contestable. Should you do the what? What's the right thing to do? We would say, should we do this? On the one hand is this and on the other hand is the other. And um, we were quite radical in the sort of subjects that we we dealt with and so we brought to public attention things that were not generally recognized. For example, I did programs, I did a long program with trans people in the 1990s when it was simply not recognized as any kind of issue. And people slightly cautiously came forward to talk to me and in um, with some reticence, but also with, with a sense of relief. And we were to, uh, able to open that idea up, not very widely, but that was uh, an achievement. We also, we tackled um, the whole business of women as priests. The programme went out within the religious department, so we had a good excuse. And, and women had, were not allowed in the priesthood at that time. And so we interviewed all the women who were, of course, enormously assertive about wanting to be priests. And we interviewed various bishops who weren't. So we, we help to further that course. So I suppose what I'm saying is furthering good courses has always been something I've wanted to do and still is. Jan, what about you? What are you most proud of? Uh, it's hard, I know. It, no, I'm thinking, I mean, one thing which I'm really proud of, and that's something we did in the House of Lords from the opposition benches, which was to introduce stalking laws so that people who are stalkers can be Bank can be can be prosecuted and banged up for now ten years, and that has made a huge difference to the lives of some women. We've still got a long way to go, and we're about to start debating and discussing the domestic violence bill in the House of Lords. And there will be some amendments that we still wish to make, Joan. But you know, we, we've got somewhere along the line. Yeah. Can I just can I just confess in front of Jan as a, a distinguished and a orthodox Labour member that I voted against the bill to bring in Brexit. And there was a three line whip to a, agree with it. And so did I. <laughs> 40, 40 of us defied the whip and went to see the head of, the, of our, um, um, our the Labour peers at that time. And I remember um, her sitting down and saying, can we explain why we're voting that way? And I remember listening 
and then saying, I, I've heard what you say, but I am going to vote against it. And I'm proud that I did. Me too. Helen Charlesworth wants to ask you both, what does the Labour Party do to win the next election? Joan, do you want to kick off with a thought about that? Well, it may, needs to make itself more widely understood and known. It is about, under the leadership of Keir Starmer, whom I backed for the leadership, is about to develop policies to appeal right across the board to people. Um, it's got a lot of work to do. It's got to be very attentive to all its members, um, including those who were in favour of Jeremy Corbyn and, and slightly resisting um, Keir Starmer's state, uh, standing. Um, so I think we need to find out about what people need, particularly in the north of England. I come from Stockport, um, and I'm very happy to see that Andy Burnham, as a mayor of Lond uh, Manchester, mm -hmm. is doing a lot of good work there. And I think that the, the north is about to come into its own, slowly come into its own. I mean, powerhouse, some glib words like that are banded around, but the north is an amazingly strong place with strong and resilient people, and they haven't been heard. Jan, have you got any thoughts? Well, I'm sure we've got lots of thoughts. I've got lots of them with us. I think the most important thing to do is to regain the trust of the British people, which patently we lost at the, the last election, but it goes much deeper than that. People haven't thought that Labour was uh, worthy of being in government for the last, clearly the last 10 years. And I think that with Keir, he is very gradually sort of gaining the trust of the British people. It's going to take a long time, but I'm confident that he can do it. And as you say, Joan, he will gradually introduce policies which will show how he intends to shape the country for the future so that it is a place where young people, middle-aged people and old people can feel safe, comfortable and can thrive. Well, I think that is an excellent and, and perhaps optimistic note uh, on which to end our conversation tonight. Uh, if you would like to support Somerville uh, in the important work of ensuring that all students irrespective of circumstances can access uh, an Oxford education as Jan was describing then do please donate to the Covid hardship fund uh, via the link. Um, I also want to tell you that October will feature more Somerville at home events including discussions to mark Black History Month and an event from the Somerville London group to consider the impact of working from home specifically is it all it's cracked up to be in the context of working families? Do not get me started on this subject. Uh, but for most importantly, I'm sure you will all want to join me in a virtual round of applause and a huge thank you uh, to Jan and to Joan. Uh, thank you both. Uh, thank you to everyone who, sorry I didn't get to all the questions, but thank you for everyone who has participated and good night. Thank you, Rebecca. It's been very enjoyable. Thank you, Rebecca. I've really enjoyed it. And talking to you, Jan, too. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone.